Okay. All right. Well, I'm 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 very sorry that uh, that your break got eaten up, but uh, uh, but thank you for being here. Uh, uh, it's um it's an honor. Uh, just a sec. Uh, yeah. So. Um, um, when I did a Google image search for quantum computer, uh, this is uh, one of the first things that came up. Uh, you know, so I, I, I'm actually a theorist. I don't spend a lot of time in the lab, so you know that might be what they look like. I don't know, but uh, um, uh, but uh, all right. So this is uh, this is not live yet, but we are uh, designing a web page for a new uh, quantum computing center at uh, UT, which. Uh, uh, um, you know, I just uh, arrived here three months ago, and uh, we're uh, so we're excited about this. So here you see uh, a Longhorn whose horns are actually uh, taking an inner product between two quantum states. Uh, there you see the uh, uh, motto: uh, 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 "Hook'em Hadamards." Uh, Hadamard is a uh, one qubit quantum gate that uh, produces interference. It's funny for the right audience. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, but uh, what, what, uh, what, 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 what many people might not know is that you know, uh, 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 the full field of quantum computing and information you know, arguably sort of started at, at here at UT in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. Uh, uh, John Archibald Wheeler uh, was here in the uh, physics department, and he was going around saying, you know, we have to uh, sort of uh, uh, rederive physics from pure information theory. You know, uh, Slogan was it from bit, okay, and uh, uh, you know, uh, so uh, it's sort of like you know we we uh, we just heard in a previous talk about you know the uh, the notion of the universe as a computer, right? Today that that I would say that that's, that's almost like a, a a boring idea, like okay, fine, you know the uni fine the universe is a computer, all right, move, you know you know now let, 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 uh, let's ask a real question, like you know <laughs> what, what what kind of computer, you know, <laughs> how how many bits does it store, right? So. Uh, but you know, but at the time that was a big deal, and you know, and he had a, a, a big group around him, uh, including a, a David Deutsch, who uh, was here for four years. Uh, you know, is widely considered, you know, along with Richard Feynman, one of the two founders of quantum computation, and sort of first started to think about those issues here. Uh, uh, Schumacher, who uh, co uh, coined the word qubit, you know, for a, a quantum bit, uh, um, and uh, uh, Wooters and uh, Zorak. Many of the other pioneers of the field. So, um, uh, so uh, uh, you know, together with uh, colleagues in uh, uh, other departments, including uh, uh, physics, uh, ECE, uh, uh, math, uh, you know, we are going to be trying to, uh, you know, build a, a new sort of uh, quantum computing presence here. You know, also with uh, uh, ARL, with uh, Texas Advanced Computing Center. Uh, with uh, you know lots of people who are who are interested in in quantum information science, uh, and uh, you know we will be uh, uh, you know bringing in additional people. So it's so it's so it's a very exciting time for uh, you know for, for for quantum information here. Okay, but let me uh, tell you my personal starting point, uh, which you know actually uh, is not about quantum mechanics at all. Uh, uh, it's it's simply uh, you know what are the ultimate limits of technology? You know. What can we build or not build? You know, not in five years. You know, not even in, in 500 years. But you know, but uh, uh, according to the laws of nature. So you know, so there are certain things that we just never seem to see. It's really annoying, right? A first example is warp drive. You know, I've been, you know, we, uh, we've been waiting. Where is it, right? A second example. You know, the only uh, uh, real solution to our energy problems. You know, after. Uh, uh, um, you know, we uh, we drill all the oil and so forth, and after the sun goes cold, you know, uh, 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 you know. And then the third example is what I'll call the Uber computer. You know, here we see it just saying, you know, gold box conjecture is true. You know, every even number four or greater is a sum of two primes. Next question. You know, of course, I'm. You know, some people might imagine that that this is what computers are, but you know, I don't have to. Uh, Explain to people here that that uh, you know uh, uh, you know for for some of the problems we want to solve we face uh, uh, intractability and even uncomputability. Uh, so um, you know now what I want to point out is that in the first two cases uh, we actually know something uh, 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 about you know about why uh, 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 you know uh, uh, we we can't build the things or what can and can't be done for uh, uh, the. Um, um, Warp drive, you know, it is uh, ruled out by uh, special relativity, or you could just say the causal structure of space and time. 
you know, you send a message faster than light, and in someone's reference frame, you're sending it back in time. Then you have to worry about what happens if you kill your grandfather and all that stuff. You don't, you know, you don't want to go there. Okay, uh, the uh, uh, perpetual motion machine. You know, there's the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, but what about the Uber computer? You know, uh, you know, is, is there a law of physics that governs that? You know, and, and more generally, say, you know, uh, 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 what are the laws of physics that govern what we can and can't compute? Uh, and you know, and and uh, if we you know discover those those rules, then then you know will they uh, be important not only for for computation but will uh, also feed back into physics. So those are sort of the things that interest me. So this is uh, uh, I don't know you know so some of the alums might remember you know suffering through this in uh, <laughs> undergrad classes or something. But this is just sort of a basic map of the world where you know I spend a lot of my time. Uh, if this is, you know, these are some basic complexity classes, uh, uh, P, the, you know, efficiently solvable stuff, NP, the uh, efficiently verifiable stuff, not necessarily efficiently solvable, and then, you know, NP hard, uh, the stuff that's at least as hard as everything in NP, and then NP complete, the sort of hardest stuff in NP. Uh, if you want about uh, 500 more complexity classes, you can go to this uh, website I created as a grad student called the uh, complexityzoo.com. Okay, but um, uh, so um, you know we uh, we all know uh, what is sort of the uh, you know literally million dollar question about that map, uh, which is you know does p equal np? Uh, you know this is one of the seven problems. For which you know, if you solve it, the uh, Clay Foundation will give you a million-dollar uh, prize, alongside the Riemann hypothesis, uh, the Poincaré conjecture, which was solved by Perelman, although he declined the prize, and uh, and four others. Okay. Uh, now, I, I believe that P versus NP is actually manifestly the most important uh, among all of, of these great math problems. And the argument for that is very simple. You know, if you could prove P equals NP, and the algorithm were efficient in practice and so forth, then you know you would solve that one problem, but you could also uh, program your computer to solve the other six for you. Okay, uh, you know you could just say you know is there a proof of the Riemann hypothesis of at most a hundred million symbols in some in some formal language, and you know if if there is one you would find it. This is this is what it would mean. Okay, so you know often people talk about P versus NP in terms of well you know airline scheduling could be made more efficient, but you know I think you know we're really asking something of almost metaphysical significance here. Okay, now uh, uh, you know uh, you, you may you may also know that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, most of us uh, sort of uh, bet that P is not equal to NP. I mean, you know, I like to say, you know, they're, they're sort of, you know, working like I do in quantum computing. I get uh, exposed to a lot of cultural differences between fields like computer science, physics. Uh, you know, so one thing I've learned is that uh, what, what we in computer science uh, uh, or, or math would, would call a conjecture, uh, the physicists call a law. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> You know, so if we were if we were physicists, we would have just declared p not equal to np to be a an observed law of nature. We would have given ourselves you know Nobel prizes for discovering it. <laughs> you know, and then and then if, if later some someone came along and proved that p equals np, we would just give ourselves more Nobel prizes for <laughs> for, for, for for falsifying that law. Okay, but you know in any case you know I'm you know I'm, I'm gonna for 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 the purposes of this talk you know treat it as a law. You know, of course, we you know we hope to someday prove it. Uh, I think that you know that is uh, uh, entirely possible, but we're a lo very long way from it. It's like asking about Fermat's last theorem in the in the 1700s. Okay, but uh, though then again, you know, I actually get solutions to the p versus np problem in my inbox, you know, about three times a week. Okay, so uh, you know, so so maybe it's not that hard. Okay, although <laughs> the pro the problem is that the solutions some of them go one way and some the other. So, um, oh yeah, and you know, and, and you can you know that this was important this problem because it's been on at least two TV shows. You know, uh, you know, also various uh, uh, less good TV shows as well. Uh, so, um, but okay, but even if we believe that p is not equal to np, that's that's not the end of the story. Uh, very far from it, you know, for for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, but one of them is that you know this um, um, you know uh, uh, question sort of uh, implicitly assumes that what we mean by a computer is well captured by you know a deterministic Turing machine. Okay, uh, and you know, and that's um, you know 
or it sort of assumes this uh, belief that uh, sometimes is called the extended church Turing thesis, uh, which, which would say that anything that can be done in, in nature uh, can be simulated with at most a polynomial overhead in time and memory and so forth uh, by a deterministic Turing machine or you know, if you want to allow a little wiggle room, then at least a, a probabilistic Turing machine. Okay, which might actually be the same thing, we don't know. But, uh, um, you know, and, and uh, you saw in a, a previous talk, uh, uh, Ed Fredkin and Stephen Wolfram, they actually believe this, okay? They, they, they literally believe this, you know, uh, still. Uh, you know, they think, you know, they think if, if quantum mechanics seems to challenge this, so much the worse for quantum mechanics. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that. But, um, uh, but, but, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, ultimately this extended church Turing thesis, you know, this, this I I identification of, you know, the polynomial time Turing machine with what we can efficiently do, you know, is a question of physics. Okay? It's not a mathematical question. It's not a philosophical one either. It is a question about what machines can or can't actually be built in physical reality. Okay, you know, one could say the same about the original church Turing thesis. You know, uh, 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 the you know the uh, uh, the computability one. Okay, the, uh, that one. You know, I think very few people, uh, uh, aside from maybe Roger Penrose, I uh, think is challenged. Okay, but uh, but as we'll see, you know, there are, you know there are lots and lots of potential challenges that you could imagine to this extended church Turing thesis. So 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 let's get an idea of what would a challenge to this ECT uh, uh, look like. Uh, well, so here's a, an old proposal. Let's, you know, long before we, uh, uh, we talk about quantum computing, uh, uh, you know, old idea, just you take two glass plates, uh, you put pegs between them in uh, whatever pattern you want, and then you dip the result into a tub of soapy water, and then you take it out. Okay, and you look at the pattern of, of soap bubbles that forms uh, 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 in between the pegs. And, you know, what tends to happen is that, you know, being uh, bubbles, you know, uh, soap films, they, they want to minimize their energy. And typically, a way to minimize energy is to minimize the total length of bubble uh, connecting all of the pegs, where the bubbles could also meet at intermediate points uh, like these. Okay, but, uh, but now this is a very, very famous problem in uh, combinatorial geometry. It's called the minimum Steiner tree problem. Or given a collection of points in the Euclidean plane, find the minimum total length of line segment uh, connecting them. And this problem is very well known to be NP-hard. Okay, so we're now faced with a puzzle, which is, you know, if nature can do this. Nature just finds this, you know, lowest energy uh, uh, bubble s uh, solution. Then, you know, is nature thereby solving, you know, an NP-hard problem in polynomial time? You know, where we could say, you know, is a to tub of soapy water doing what, you know, Stampede and all of the other supercomputers in the world cannot do? Okay, uh, so uh, you know there was a discussion of this question on the internet some some time ago, and uh, you know some people made what I think was the right analysis of the situation, which was to say, look, uh, you know, I mean, systems in nature can get trapped in local optima, right? You know, if you had a rock and some crevice on a mountainside, it could reach a state of lower potential energy by rolling up first and then rolling down, but it's rarely observed to do that. Okay, so, you know, I mean, I mean, why shouldn't the same be true here? That, you know, you could just get trapped in some local optimum. And then someone else said, well, this is just, you know, an academic, you know, CS department, a party line. I bet not one of you ever tried the experiment. You have no idea what you're talking about. This actually led to the one foray into experimental physics in my life. I, I told you that I'm a theorist, but, you know, I did. Uh, uh, build this, uh, you know, it, 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 it eventually it, it, uh, broke. I, I don't still have it. And I, I also, I, I cut my hands. You should use plexiglass if you, uh, if you, try, if you, try, if you try this at home. Okay, but, uh, but basically, you know, what, what I found is that, you know, with three or four or five pegs, uh, you usually do f actually find the minimum Steiner tree. It's, uh, it's very cool to watch it uh, relax to that. You start adding more pegs, let's say six, uh, seven, and then sometimes it does get stuck in a suboptimal solution. In fact, sometimes you get something that's not even a tree. It has an intermediate cycle, which then proves that it can't be optimal. Okay, so uh, you know, I, I didn't like test every possible brand of soap or something, but <laughs> I think that there's uh, some circumstantial evidence here that nature is not solving NP-complete problems by magic. 
right? And this sounds silly, and yet, you know, in the popular press, you will constantly read, like, you know, uh, uh, conceptually, you know, uh, uh, identical things, right? Like, like, what about, you know, protein folding, right? Protein folding is an NP hard problem. It can be formalized as such, and yet every cell in your body is doing it every second. So it must be that, that you know, that, 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 you know, NP complete problems aren't that hard after all, and, you know, computer scientists are wrong. Okay, well, you know, I think that the, uh, 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 the answer to that is, well, is first of all, that there is a lot of selection pressure in biology for making proteins that will fold in a, in a you know, in a pretty uh, a reliable way, you know, easily. I mean, a, a pro, you know, um, you know, if you, um, uh, you know, in principle, you could engineer some enormous protein such that from its best folding configuration, you could read out from that a proof of the Riemann hypothesis, right? That's what it means for the problem to be NP-complete, okay? Uh, but, uh, you know, but I think that would be kind of a bad protein, right? As in, you know, biology would select against it. You know, you wouldn't expect it to fold very well in nature. Okay, so, uh, so, so there's, you know, you know, computer scientists, you know, have seen lots of sort of cases like that. Let me just tell you some of my other sort of f favorite cases. Uh, uh, to set the stage, uh, uh, one of them, you know, I mean, we talk, we talk all about quantum computers, but you know, well, you know, well, why doesn't relativity get any love, right? So, what about the relativity computer, you know, whose uh, idea is very, very simple? You just set your computer working on some, you know, very hard problem. Uh, you leave your computer on Earth. You then board a spaceship that will accelerate to close to the speed of light. You decelerate. You return to Earth. Now, you know, in Earth's reference frame, uh, billions of years will have passed. Uh, you know, civilization will have collapsed, presumably, you know, if, if it didn't long before that. And, you know, all your friends will be long dead. Okay, but if, you know, somehow from the rubble you could dig out your computer and, you know, it had a power source where it was still running, uh, well, you would get the answer to your hard problem. So, uh, you know, so, 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 so to me, this immediately raises a question, which is, why doesn't anyone try this? Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, if you're concerned about your friends, you just bring them on the spaceship with you, okay? <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, you know, but I, I, I think it's, you know, the, you know, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and we're not going to worry about, you know, engineering difficulties or anything like that, okay? Uh, you know, the question is, is there a problem of principle in, in doing this? Uh, so I think that the interest, the very interesting answer is that yes, there is one. Uh, in this case, uh, it has to do with the amount of energy that it would take to accelerate to uh, that close to the speed of light and then decelerate. Uh, you can show that you know, if you wanted an exponential computational speed up, then you would need to accelerate to where uh, you know, the, dis the difference between your speed and that of light was exponentially small. That would take an exponential amount of energy. Okay, so, so now we face sort of a, a new question, which is you know, do you need exponential time just to fuel up? before you uh, take off, right? Where, where are you getting this exponential amount of energy from, okay? Or, you know, can you somehow compress it into a small tank? But that, that leads to its own problems, okay? So uh, it's a good example of how, you know, very, very often, you know, it can look like you get some computational superpower if you just look at, you know, one law of physics in isolation from all the rest. But you really have to look at all of them together, okay? Uh, you know, so another similar example is uh, what I like to call the Zeno computer. And this was simply a computer that would do the first step of its operation in, in one second, the next step in half a second, the next in a quarter second, and so on, so that after two seconds it would have done infinitely many steps. Um, you know, again, we could ask why doesn't anyone try that? Okay, and here I think the answer is, you know, in some sense people do try that, right? There are people who try to overclock their microprocessor and, you know, run it faster than it's supposed to. Okay, but many of you know the problem with doing that, which is that, you know, if you run a uh, processor too, too much faster than uh, its recommended speed, it will melt. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, this is why computers have fans. This is why, you know, there used to be supercomputers that were, you know, that were uh, uh, cooled with, with liquid nitrogen or, you know, helium and so forth so, so that they could be run faster. Okay, but now, you know, again, we, you know, we should ask, uh, uh, you know, forget about practical constraints. You know, what are the fundamental limits on, on what you could do here? Okay, so, uh, you know, one can show that if you wanted to run a uh, computer faster and faster, have more and more hertz, you know, you would need to concentrate more and more energy in a smaller and smaller space. Initially, it will be because of cooling. 
But uh, ultimately, you know, if you uh, get down to the, the Planck scale or something, you might as well just think about you know, a, a very, very simple kind of computer as being like a photon that bounces back and forth between two mirrors to tick off time. Right? And then you could ask, what would happen if that photon had to bounce back and forth 10 to the 43 times per second, okay, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, once per Planck time. Uh, you know, g going 10 to the minus 33 centimeters across. And the answer is that uh, such a photon would have to have so much energy concentrated in so, so small of a, a space that uh, it would exceed the Schwarzschild radius, uh, which, is, uh, another, you know, which, which, which simply means that your computer would collapse to a black hole. Okay, which uh, you know I've always really liked as nature's way of telling you not to try something. Um, okay, okay, but uh, what about uh, quantum computing? Uh, uh, you know, you knew that that was coming, uh, presumably. Uh, these are some happy uh, spin one half particles. Uh, uh, so uh, you know, like like you know, I think when you read about it in the popular press. Uh, quantum computing sounds almost as outlandish as these other things that I talked about, okay? And yet, you know, you know that there are these experimental groups all over the world that are actually trying to build uh, quantum computers, uh, you know, and who, who uh, uh, and that, you know, uh, uh, many people take it extremely seriously. So what? So what? So so what is the difference? Uh, so uh, well, you know, to um, you know, like when I was a, a, a teenager and I first, you know, uh, read about uh, a quantum computing in the in the press, I, you know, my, my my first reaction was, you know, this is obviously just hype. This is obviously just some physicists who sort of don't understand the enormity of what they are denying, right? That you know, that the universe is, you know, at the bottommost level, it is this array of bits that you know have to, you know be governed by some, you know, Boolean logic operations, you know, and, uh, you know, all the, all the, uh, uh, you know, the standard model and, you know, uh, uh, fermions and bosons, all the stuff, you know, physicists talk about, those are just encoding details, right? <laughs> These are, you know, choice of programming language or whatever, okay? But, uh, uh, you know, but then I, uh, uh, just, you know, just to be sure, I said, you know, I have to learn what is this quantum mechanics? What does it say? Uh, yeah, so here I am, tw uh, 20 years later. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so you know, the I think you know, uh, physicists did like this incredible job uh, uh, for almost a century of sort of convincing everyone that quantum mechanics is somehow complicated or hard. Uh, uh, the reality is that it is it's this incredibly simple thing uh, once you take the physics out of it. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, I mean, you know, you can put the physics back in later if you if you want to, and you know that's that's great. But uh, but uh, but but I think at its core, you know, qu quantum mechanics is is not even really physics. It's more like an operating system that physics runs on as application software. Okay, and uh, it is you know it is a certain generalization of the rules of probability theory themselves. Okay, so uh, you know probability, you know, you might say. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's a, uh, uh, well, you know, whatever it is, 90, you know, percent probability that UT will win against Baylor, or you know, maybe maybe you would say there's a, you know, so, you know, the other side would say it's a, you know, a 10 percent probability, but no one says there's a minus 50 percent probability, let alone, you know, an an, uh, an I over two probability, right? <laughs> That's just stupid, okay? But uh, quantum mechanics is uh, based on these complex numbers called amplitudes. And um, uh, you know, and, and amplitudes have not only a magnitude but also a direction. Okay, and uh, uh, basically, if you want to know the probability that something is going to happen, you know, the central thing quantum mechanics says is that you've got to add up the amplitudes for all the different ways that it could happen. Okay, and then uh, you take the squared absolute value of the result. Okay, but uh, gives you a, a, a probability, okay? But the result is that if something could happen one way with a positive amplitude, another way with a negative amplitude, those two ways can cancel each other out so that the thing never happens at all. Um, that's quantum mechanics, okay? In, uh, in uh, a, a less than one slide, okay? So um, um, now, um, you know, uh, you know in what, it, what, it's, um, what it says in particular is that um, um, if you, um, 
Uh, if you had a, a system with n interacting particles, let's say, you have to assign one of these complex numbers, uh, these amplitudes, to every possible configuration of all n of the particles together. Okay, so let's say that each particle stores one bit of information. Like it can be spinning up or spinning down. Doesn't, uh, uh, not relevant here what that means. Okay, well then, uh, for all n of the particles, there are two to the n possible configurations. Right, the rules of quantum mechanics, which we've known since 1926 and which haven't changed uh, a dot since then, okay, and tell you that you need to assign an amplitude to every one of those two to the n configurations, okay, in order to fully describe the state of that system, you know, which is, you know, uh, you know, and I think the enormity of that didn't sink in on people, you know, until until really the 80s. Okay, uh, uh, because it's saying that just to keep track of the state of a thousand measly particles, uh, nature if off to the side somewhere has to keep some scratch paper with two to the thousand complex numbers, which is way more than the number of particles in the visible universe. Only, only 10 to the 80 or something, 10 to the 85 or something, okay? And, you know, and then whenever something happens to those particles, you know, nature has to cross off those two to the thousand numbers and write new ones. That's an immense amount of effort for nature to be going to, to keep track of a few, you know, a small number of particles. Okay, chemists and physicists actually knew this for decades. They knew it mostly as a practical problem. You know, when you're trying to simulate quantum mechanics uh, in order to, you know, uh, uh, um, understand, you know, the ground state of your favorite molecule, whatever, you know, solve the Schrodinger equation, right? The difficulty, you know, multiplies with each particle that you have to add, okay? And, you know, they spent many decades inventing clever heuristics to get around that problem, okay? But it was uh, really in the early 80s that, uh, um, the, the, that a few people like David Deutsch and Richard Feynman uh, suggested sort of turning this lemon into lemonade. Okay, and you know, they, they uh, uh, had the thought that, well, if, if, if quantum mechanics is so hard to simulate on our existing computers, then why don't we build computers that would themselves uh, take advantage of you know, these giant lists of amplitude that could be maintained in these superposition states and that could therefore take advantage of this, uh, these sort of interference effects. Now, of course, they then faced the question, supposing that we built such a computer, uh, what would it be useful for? Okay, they uh, were sort of only able to suggest one answer to that question. Uh, it would be good for simulating quantum mechanics. Okay, uh, which, you know, by the way, you know, if, if, if we ever get uh, uh, useful quantum computers, I think that, you know, that is, that is still sort of the most important commercial application that we know about. Uh, you know, it has enormous applications to, uh, you know, designing um, um, better photovoltaics, uh, understanding high temperature superconductors, uh, um, you know, understanding how, you know, how some drug binds to a receptor, you know, protein folding, you know, sort of anything in chemistry or physics which involves many interacting particles and we're getting the quantum effects right is important, which is actually a significant percentage of everything we try to do with, with high performance computing. Okay, um, so yeah, the power of two to the n complex numbers working for you. Okay, uh, okay, and I sort of already said this, you know, quantum mechanics Basically, it just takes, you know, if you just went to a mathematician in the 1800s and said, I want you to take probability theory, which involves, you know, these vectors of unit one norm, and I want something like it, but it should involve vectors of unit two norm, you'd pretty much force them to invent quantum mechanics. Okay, now that's not how it happened. You know, no mathematician was sort of, you know, uh, uh, crazy enough to, uh, to do this. You know, and, and, and it took all these experiments, you know, in the early 20th century. Okay, but it, but it could have happened that way. Uh, okay, so now, you know, at this, before going any further, I ought to address what's probably, you know, the central misconception uh, about quantum computing that, that people have. And this has sort of been, you know, re, you know repeated in, uh, 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 you know, in, in thousands of popular articles over two decades. You know, I, I have a blog where, uh, you know, I try to uh, uh, fight this. It's like, you know, emptying the ocean with a teaspoon or something. Okay, uh, you know, a quantum computer uh, does not work by just trying every possible answer in parallel. Okay, now, uh, uh, the reason why that, that you know, uh, 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 misconception arises is that you know, you know, a, a superposition does involve you know, this enormous number of, of, uh, of, 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 of states 
sort of uh, all maintained at once. And you know, you could actually uh, create a quantum superposition over every possible solution to, let's say, you know, your NP complete problem. That's actually a very easy thing to do. Okay, the problem comes in, you know, in at some point you've got to measure your computer. <laughs> okay, at some point you've got to look at this thing if you want to get an answer out. Okay, and if you just had an equal superposition of all possible answers and you measured it, uh, all you would see would be a random answer. Okay, the rules are very clear about that. And if you just wanted a random answer, well, you could have picked one yourself with a lot less trouble. Okay, so the entire hope of getting a speed advantage from a quantum computer really comes from these minus signs. Okay, it comes from the phenomenon of interference. Okay, the idea in quantum computing is always you're trying to choreograph things so that for each wrong answer, uh, some of the paths that lead to it have positive amplitude and some paths have negative amplitude. So on the whole, they cancel out. Okay, whereas uh, for the right answer, the amplitudes should be all positive, you know, say, or, or all negative, basically in phase with each other. Okay? Uh, if you can arrange that, then when you measure, you'll observe the right answer, uh, you know, or at least observe it with high probability, okay? which you know, you know, a 10% probability of uh, seeing the prime factors of your number is, 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 is awesome. You know, if you don't like it, just repeat the computation 10 times. Okay, so, um, uh, but, but, but you really have to choreograph this pattern of interference that concentrates amplitude on the right answer. You have to do that despite not knowing in advance which answer is the right one, which would make the whole thing trivial. Okay, so it, it was not obvious that that, you know, that weird hammer that physics gives you was really useful for any nails besides just the, you know, the, the tautological one of simulating quantum physics itself. Okay, and that's, that's why it was um, um, a big surprise to people. Uh, so so let, me, let me first say that, uh, uh, you know, as computer scientists, we can associate any concept with an inscrutable sequence of capital letters. So, uh, you know, so there is a quantum generalization of P, which we call BQP, bounded error quantum polynomial time, like the class of all the things that we can do efficiently with a quantum computer. Okay, and uh, so, you know, so then the question, okay, this at least contains P. Question is, you know, is it bigger? How much bigger? Uh, so uh, the discovery that really started this field was uh, uh, when, uh, um, in 1994, uh, Peter Shore showed that uh, the problem of factoring integers uh, is in BQP. Okay? There is an efficient quantum algorithm to solve it. Uh, you know, factoring is, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of interest to uh, uh, number theorists, uh, recreational mathematicians, math hobbyists, uh, and others as well, uh, for some reason, okay? So, um, you know, also discrete log and, you know, in fact, uh, uh, problems, you know, sufficient to break uh, essentially all of the public key cryptography uh, that we use today. Uh, not the stuff that, that, that Brent talked about this morning, uh, possibly, okay? Uh, there are theoretical public key crypto systems that might not be breakable even with a quantum computer, okay? But the stuff we use today would, uh, would be broken. Uh, so, um, you know, so, so our new world map uh, would say, you know, so here's BQP. I drew it with this wavy border because everything quantum is, you know, spooky and <laughs> weird. But, uh, um, uh, so BQP contains factoring. Uh, uh, now, you know, notice, you know, we, we do not think that BQP contains all of NP, okay, which is a very important point. You know, in the other direction, uh, um, 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 B, um, BQP might not be contained in NP. There could be problems a quantum computer can solve, but, you know, w which could only be verified, where the answer could only be verified by building another quantum computer. Uh, okay, so now, of course, what people want to know is can quantum computers actually be built? Well, you know, the simple answer is quantum computers already have built, uh, or already have been built. I mean, you know, we've, uh, you know, there's been, uh, uh, I think, several billions of dollars of investment in this field so far uh, all over the world. We have successfully managed, uh, just to take one example, uh, to factor 21 into 3 times 7 uh, with high statistical confidence. Okay, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think 35 maybe, you know, is, is on the near horizon. Uh, so, you know, I mean, sc look, sc scaling it up is obviously difficult. Um, you know, and, and, and we, know, we understand the reason why. It's basically because of decoherence 
which means sort of unwanted interaction between the state of the quantum computer and its external environment. Okay, so you, you should think of it as, you know, the external world is constantly trying to measure the quantum computer and say, well, you know, you know which, which of, these, of these two to the n states are you really in? You know, uh, j just like if you had a Schrodinger's cat, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, all the air molecules in the room and the radiation would constantly, in effect, be asking the question, are you alive or are you dead? Okay, and so the, so the cat wouldn't actually maintain its superposition state for, uh, you know, for, uh, for more than a tiny fraction of a second. Okay, so, uh, so that's the problem with quantum computing, that uh, you, know, you need all these qubits uh, to be interacting with each other in a very, very uh, uh, precise and choreographed way, but you also need them to not be interacting with the external world, or, or, or very little. Okay, uh, you know, now this problem is so severe that you know, you, you, you know, we even you know, encounter skeptics who say quantum computing is just fundamentally impossible. You know, you will never do this. Okay, uh, so um, uh, you know, to my mind, the number one application of quantum computing. You know, I don't, you know, I mean, you know, a code breaking. You know, whatever. We'll switch to other codes. Okay, uh, uh, you know, quantum simulation. Okay, it'll make someone some money or something. Okay, the thing that I care about is just disproving the people who say this is impossible. Okay, uh, and you know, and and. Uh, you know, if, 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 if they turned out to be right, well then, you know, that, that's so much the better because then we have a revolution in physics on our hands, right? You know, the idea that a quantum computer will work, like the theory says, is the boring conservative possibility, right? Anything else is, is an exciting possibility, okay? Uh, and, you know, what, what really uh, convinced people that this was this situation was a huge discovery in the mid-90s, which is called the quantum fault tolerance theorem. And what this basically said is that you don't have to get decoherence down to zero. Okay, you just have to get it to some very low but finite point, and then you can start applying very, very clever error correcting codes that will uh, push the effect of decoherence down further and further. It's like passing the uh, critical mass for a, you know, a nuclear reaction. Okay, we're not there yet. Uh, so, you know, now a very important point, I told you factoring is in BQP, but factoring is neither known nor believed to be NP-complete. Uh, and today, you know, we don't think that quantum computers can solve NP-complete problems in polynomial time. Can we prove that? Well, of course not. We can't even prove that classical computers can't do it. That's the P versus NP question, okay? We do know that if there were a quantum algorithm for, that solved NP-complete problems quickly, it would have to exploit their structure in some very deep way, just like a classical algorithm would have to. Okay, and in particular, if you throw away the structure of a problem and just think of it as like an abstract space of two to the n possible solutions, that you can just check whether each one is right, well then even a quantum computer is going to need uh, uh, at least you know, the square root of two to the n time in order to find a solution. Now that square root speed up is actually achievable, uh, with what's called Grover's algorithm, okay? But uh, if you want to do any better than that, then you have to exploit structure. Okay, there's a, a, a famous proposal for how to, you know, you might exploit structure uh, called the quantum adiabatic algorithm. It's like a, a quantum version of uh, simulated annealing. You may have heard of a company called D-Wave in Vancouver, which has spent uh, $150 million or more so far, been on the cover of Time Magazine and stuff, for uh, selling what, what they ca call uh, commercial quantum computers. Right? They sold two of them, uh, one to Lockheed Martin, the other one to Google. Their whole approach is based on this, uh, uh, you know, some sort of noisy approximation to this quantum adiabatic algorithm. Okay, now, uh, what happens, well, what's happened in the last few years is that because they sold two of their devices, now there have been independent experiments done on them, and so now we, we know a lot more about what is going on with these devices than we did before. Uh, and, uh, you know, a very short uh, uh, story is, you know, it seems pretty consistent with what most of, you know, with what most of the theorists sort of uh, expected, not that you know, anyone listened, uh, to, uh, but uh, yes, you know, these devices do sort of solve some optimization problem that you can encode on them. Their latest model has a, a 2,000 qubits or so. Uh, uh, you know, it, it does a reasonable job at sort of you know, finding its own lowest energy state, you could say. And uh, you know, there are quantum effects like tunneling that are relevant at the level of one qubit, probably even uh, uh, eight qubits. Uh, more, uh, more we don't know. 
Okay, at any rate, the quantum effects that are there in the device do not seem to help in solving problems faster than you could solve them classically. Um, and uh, you know, mo so most of us have thought from the beginning and still think that if you want to get a real speed up compared to a classical computer, you're going to need much, much higher quality qubits, okay, which is what you know, other experimental groups around the world have been working toward. Um, now, but there's even a further question, which is even if you had a perfectly ideal quantum computer, we still don't know uh, exactly what kind of speed up this adiabatic algorithm would give you compared to our best classical heuristic algorithms, like simulated annealing. Okay, uh, you know, the running time is determined by something called the spectral gap of the Hamiltonian. Don't worry what that is, but basically, uh, 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 however small this is, you have to run for the inverse of that amount of time. Okay, so if this gap between energy levels becomes exponentially small, then you have to run the adiabatic algorithm exponentially long to reach uh, the optimal solution. Okay, so uh, Farhi, uh, my former colleague, a co-inventor of the adiabatic algorithm, uh, tells a story that uh, he went to uh, experts in condensed matter physics, and uh, he went to an expert and asked, you know, how do you think this spectral gap is going to behave? Because physicists have like decades of experience calculating these spectral gaps for their own reasons. And the expert thought about it and he said, I think that this gap is going to decrease exponentially as a function of the number of particles. That was not the answer that far he wanted to hear. Okay, and he said, why? What's the physical reason for thinking that? And the guy thought about it some more and he said, well, it's because otherwise your algorithm would work. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I do think that there's something deep here, which is that you know, if you see enough failed attempts to solve NP-complete problems, you might be tempted to just put the hardness of solving them as like a principle alongside the impossibility of faster than light signaling or whatever, and then say, okay, what, are, what other consequences does that principle have? How, uh, how much time? Or how mu five minutes, okay. So, uh, so, all right, so five minutes should be enough to tell you about my research. Uh, so, uh, so I should say at some point it was the stuff that I do. So, uh, so a, a major direction that I have got interested in in the you know, last uh, six or seven years and I want to continue working on in the next few years at UT is something that's uh, sometimes been called a quantum supremacy. So uh, people are now uh, backing away from that name uh, uh, because of uh, uh, the uh, current U.S. election. But uh, uh, <laughs> will, you know, will, will, uh, when people ask, uh, will, well, will I disavow quantum supremacists and quantum <laughs> supremacism, uh, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to keep you in suspense, okay? <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but what, the, what, the, what, the, what, the, what this term means to me is just uh, getting a clear quantum speed up uh, for some task, hopefully in the near future, you know, using technologies that, fall, that, may fall sh that may fall short of being a universal quantum computer. Okay, notice I did not say a useful task, okay? That is, that is not part of the, 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 the goal here. We want to, you know, again, prove what is possible, okay? Like, uh, uh, Enrico Fermi, you know, built, doing the first chain reaction in uh, 1942, right? It didn't, uh, it wasn't a bomb, but it's, you know, you know, it, it, you know, then, then the whole, you know, the whole discussion about, you know, uh, nuclear energy would could take place on a different plane. Okay, so, uh, so we have, you know, uh, uh, several propose. Uh, I guess my colleagues and I have come up with several proposals for uh, how you could do the first experiment that we could be very, very confident is asymptotically hard to simulate using a classical computer, right? So get some kind of quantum speed up for something. Okay, and it seems to be very, very helpful for this to look at sampling problems. That is, instead of problems with a single uh, right answer, problems that involve outputting a sample from a desired probability distribution, okay? These have a long history in computer science. You know, they're, they're in, they're in uh, uh, Knuth you know, uh, sampling random permutations. Okay, uh, my student uh, Alex Arkhipov and I had a proposal called boson sampling, which is basically you uh, input a bunch of single photons into a network of beam splitters. You let them pass through. They, you know, they evolve in a superposition state. Okay, and then you have an array of photo detectors that just measure how many photons are there in each output mode. Okay, and that gives you, you know, a, some sample from some probability distribution over all the possible configurations of the n photons. And that's it. That's all this computer does. 
Okay, so uh, um, it is, uh, as far as we can tell, it is useful for nothing. Um, but simulating it appears to be hard. Okay, and so uh, we, can, we can actually prove a theorem that says if you had a classical algorithm that sampled the same probability distribution that this device samples from, then the uh, p to the sharp p would equal bpp to the np. If you don't know what that means, uh, it's bad. Okay, uh, you, know, you know, in fact, you know, you know, I, I think it's much less likely than there being, say, a fast classical factoring algorithm, right? You know, I mean, if, if that existed, yeah, it would collapse, you know, most of the world's digital commerce, but uh, as far as we know, it wouldn't collapse the polynomial hierarchy, right? Uh, this would collapse the polynomial hierarchy, okay? So, you know, which is sort of almost as bad as P equaling NP. So, um, uh, so now, uh, oh, and, and uh, uh, you know, when we, uh, we proposed this just a sort of pure complexity theory, but at some point it occurred to us that, that bosons, you know, in particular photons actually exist. And, you know, there are these uh, experimentalists who like to play with them. You know, and as it happens, you know, they were sort of looking for something to do, so they kind of ate this up. And, you know, in, in the last few years, there's been a whole bunch of experiments by groups all over the world experimentally demonstrating boson sampling. The record so far is a six photon demonstration uh, by a, a group at a Bristol in the UK. Uh, now, if you really want to, something that's hard to simulate with a classical computer, you'll probably want at least 30 photons. Okay, and that is uh, scaling it up is hard because you need very reliable single photon sources that just spit out one photon on demand, and that doesn't really exist yet, but people are working on it. Uh, so, you know, another thing you could do is just, you know, take your collection of qubits, put some sort of random quantum circuit on them, just, you know, measure, and then that's, that gives you another probability distribution that uh, may be hard to, to uh, sample from classically. Uh, uh, the group of John Martinez at Google, which uh, is probably like the best superconducting qubits group in, in the world, is uh, uh, currently uh, aiming to do this with a system of 40 or 50 very, very high quality uh, 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 qubits in a, in a, in a 2D uh, square array. Uh, they, you know, they say that they're gonna do, be able to have this in, in, within the next year or two. Uh, you know, now translated from experimentalist jargon, that might mean five years, okay, but I don't think it means infinity years, okay? So, uh, you know, and, and now part of what we're thinking about is, you know, once they build this, what should they do with it that, that we're actually confident would be hard for a classical computer, right? What is going to give clear evidence for a separation? And also, you know, if once they do this experiment, how should they validate the results? How should they know which distribution they were sampling from? Okay, so there's a lot of issues. Uh, now, now, another thing that, that's happened recently is that uh, uh, ideas from quantum computing have sort of started infesting all sorts of neighboring fields. Uh, so uh, in particular, uh, there was an amazing connection made within the last five years uh, between quantum computing and uh, 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 Hawking's black hole information problem, right? So in the 70s, uh, uh, Hawking, that's him, uh, proposed this, uh, 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 pointed out this paradox, you know, how can information ever escape from a black hole? Uh, it has to if quantum mechanics is universally valid, okay, and yet, you know, uh, seems to violate the definition of a black hole. Okay, so that puzzle led to a, a viewpoint called black hole complementarity in the 1990s, according to which everything that's inside a black hole is actually just in, also encoded sort of as quantum information that lives on or near the event horizon of the black hole. So there's sort of two complementary views. I'm sort of compressing a lot here. But, uh, uh, but then this complementarity led to something a few years ago that you may have read about called the firewall paradox. You know, physicists have awesome names for things. You know, we're stuck with non-deterministic polynomial time, okay? But, uh, uh, but, uh, but the firewall paradox basically said, if you, you know, sat outside of a black hole for, you know, wait, waited for it to mostly evaporate into Hawking radiation, which for a black hole, the mass of our sun would take about 10 to the 67 years. You know, we'll assume you have a really long grant, okay? And uh, <laughs> you collect the Hawking radiation, there is some way that you could process it uh, so that if you then jumped into the black hole to see what happened, you would see that, that you had destroyed the whole geometry of space-time in the interior of the black hole which was dual to the Hawking radiation. And then people said, all right, that, 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 that seems bad. That, 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 that shouldn't be possible. 
And uh, so then, you know, a, you know, an, an incredible insight about this problem, uh, I think, was uh, uh, came in a paper in um, 2013 uh, by uh, uh, Daniel Harlow and Patrick Hayden. And what they said was that yes, in principle, this is true. Such an ex such a measurement on the Hawking radiation is formally allowed by quantum mechanics, but how hard would it be to actually do it? And they gave very strong evidence that to do that experiment would require solving a problem that is exponentially hard even for a quantum computer. So, you know, it wouldn't take 10 to the 67 years, but 2 to the 10 to the 67 years. So then, you know, the black hole would have long ago evaporated anyway, so maybe there's no problem, right? Uh, you know, and, and their evidence that it was hard actually relied on results about the limitations of quantum computers that I proved in my PhD thesis. So, you know, I had no idea that they would be used for such a thing, but, you know, but then, uh, you know, I sort of had no choice but to get involved. I've improved their arguments uh, to rely on more generic assumptions in cryptography. You know, more broadly, we've been able to use ideas from quantum computing theory to get new insights into condensed matter physics, uh, quantum gravity, even classical computer science. There are theorems in classical uh, CS theory that we only know how to prove by going through quantum computing as an intermediate step, which I think is pretty awesome. Uh, so, summary, uh, quantum computers are the most powerful kind of computer allowed by the currently known laws of physics. Uh, there's a realistic prospect of building them. Contrary to what you read, even they would have limits, but those limits you know, are good for something. For, they could help protect the geometry of space-time. Thank you.